to my series called Reconciliation. And you know, this is so needed today in our nation and in our world. We're very, very divided. So, in the first two segments of this series, you and I took a close look at what God says about reconciliation in Romans 12, 17 through 21. And I'm going to read that again. God's word never returns void, and it's powerful. And we need to hear it over and over and speak it over our lives. So I'm going to read this out loud again, Romans 12, 17 through 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So I want to begin today by reading an excerpt from a book by Anne Graham Lotz. And in this book, she says, Death is the trigger for reconciliation between my wounders and me, my death. I have to die to my pride and my position as the one whose forgiveness should be sought by them. I need to be easily approachable as Jesus has been for me. I need to love those who have rejected me as Jesus loved me. I need to initiate the contact as Jesus did for me. I need to extend forgiveness to them before they even ask me for it, as Jesus did for me. That's pretty good stuff. And as Anne alluded, sometimes we, the offendee, have to initiate reconciliation to our offender. So now I'm going to finish my story. I had told you in a previous vlog about how I reacted inappropriately to someone who had offended me. And in that story, this person had made a false accusation against one of my family members. And uh, this family member who did that, I totally withdrew from, I cut myself off from, had no contact, no conversation, anything. And it was for six months. So again, I'm not proud of that. But that's who I was at that time. I was not in God's Word. I did not know what He had to say about it. And that's my responsibility as well. But what happened after six months was we had a family gathering on a holiday. And for the sake of other family members, um, I approached the person who had made the false accusation. And I said, okay, let's not do this anymore. You know, let's get along. And, you know, that, that was a pretty bare minimum. But there was some goodness in my heart. And I give God credit for that. Um, to initiate reconciliation with someone who should have come to me first, but didn't. At least that's what we think, right, in our flesh. But I also want to say that ever since, and this has been many, many years, um, we've been in great relationship. Uh, we've had no problems, and it's all been good. Now, I did not do it the right way. So let's continue now with verse 20 to learn Jesus' way. The word says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Well, this seems like the last thing we want to do to someone who's just put a dagger in our heart, right? But isn't it what Jesus did, just as Anne said? God sent Jesus from his throne in the perfection of heaven to live on this nasty earth with his enemies, you and me knowing he would die the exact death he died. He spent three years feeding people, physically and spiritually. He told the woman at the well that he would give her living water and she'd never thirst again. And that's for us too. He did it for every one of us and he expects us to do it for one another. But he doesn't expect us to do it on our own, in our own strength or our own power. He knows we couldn't. He gives us Holy Spirit, who helps us to live like Jesus because he is the Spirit of Jesus, and he indwells the heart of every person who accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. 
The Jeremiah Study Bible calls the feeding and giving drink to our enemies the principle of replacement. It is powerful. It is not enough to passively accept your enemy's actions or even to accept them with the view toward God's intervention and justice. Christians are to do the opposite of what their enemies do, replacing evil with good. So I want to take a moment now and just stop, hit the pause button, and I want to say what may not be obvious so far. I am not saying that anyone should reconcile with someone who is a true danger to them. God doesn't expect that. Do we have to forgive them? Yes. But that is as much for us as it is for them. Even more, really. So I appreciate your time and your heart today to know God's will concerning reconciliation. And next week, we're going to conclude this series of what God has to say to us as his followers, how we are supposed to be reconciled to our enemies and what he expects us to do. Blessings to you all today. Love you much.